What exactly is a self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, almost 40 years ago, sociologist Robert K. Merton of Columbia University developed the concept of the self-fulfilling prophecy. The notion that the expectation of an event can actually cause it to happen. The essence of the self-fulfilling prophecy is that it starts with a belief that is not necessarily true at the time it is held, but when people act on this belief and do so collectively, they tend to produce a situation which then becomes true. Beliefs create reality. In fact, the self-fulfilling prophecy is basic to a great deal of the triumphs and troubles of human society. But where does the self-fulfilling prophecy come from? And how does it work? Well, the idea that one person's expectations can influence events has its roots in ancient mythology. In the 10th book of Metamorphosis, Ovid tells the story of the sculptor Pygmalion, whose goal it was to create a statue of the ideal woman, which he called Galatea. He succeeded all too well. Pygmalion fell desperately in love with his own creation. Finally, Venus took pity on Pygmalion and brought Galatea to life. Hmm. Hmm. Years later, another Pygmalion, Professor Henry Higgins, believed he could create something even more difficult. A duchess out of a flower girl. Remember that you're a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech and that your language is the language of Milton, Shakespeare, the Bible. You don't sit there crooning like a bilious pigeon. Oh! Heavens, what a sound. You see this creature with her curved stone English, the English that will keep her in the gutter for the rest of her days? Well, sir, in three months I could pass her off as a duchess at an ambassador's reception. No, no, no. Yes, I could even get her a job as a lady's maid or a shop assistant, which requires better English. You mean you could make me? Yes, you squashed cabbage leaf. You disgraced the noble architecture of these columns. You incarnate insult of the English language. I can pass you off as the Queen of Sheba. <laughs> Measured on people. 
In 1969, Rosenthal began an experiment to test the Pygmalion effect in the classroom. Rosenthal told each teacher in a typical elementary school that a special test designated 20% of her students as intellectual bloomers. He assured each teacher that these pupils, on their own, would show remarkable gain in intelligence in the next eight months. Of course, the children had really been chosen at random. At that point, the only difference between them and their classmates was in the mind of the teacher. Expectations. At the end of the school term, a test revealed that the so-called bloomers had actually bloomed gaining four points more in total IQ than their classmates. We weren't all that surprised by the basic results of this experiment. For those kids who were expected to do well, and for those kids who were already in the fast track of the school, the more those kids gained in IQ, the more favorably they were viewed by their teachers. But there was a result that took us quite by surprise. For those kids for whom no special favorable expectations were held, and especially if they were already in the slow track of the school, the more those kids gained in IQ, and some of them gained quite a lot, the more unfavorably they were viewed by their teachers. That's scary. Teachers seem to prefer, and indeed maybe other people do too, that others behave as they are expected to. The experimental Pygmalion results were impressive. But could they be transferred from the classroom to the workplace? Pygmalion effect exerts its extraordinary power. We don't know what the mechanism is, but we do know that in a general way, Pygmalions of all kinds, whether they're experimenters expecting things from their research subjects, or whether they're teachers expecting things from their pupils, or whether they're managers expecting things from their employees, they have to be treating those students, those experimental subjects, those employees in a different way. And the ways in which they treat them differently can be subtle indeed. It might have to do with something as subtle as glancing, nodding, and generally creating a favorable climate. Because the cues can be so subtle, might even give the appearance of being almost magical. But of course it's not magical. Rosenthal and his colleagues have conducted over a hundred scientific experiments to determine how expectations are transmitted through specific behavior. And their four-factor theory identifies those behaviors. <laughs> to make some notes on the client profile that you gave me. Very good. Well, let's have a look at it. Well, you've pinpointed several key elements here. Cash flow, asset base, investment. Factor number one, climate, Growth. is composed of all the nonverbal messages from the manager, such as tone of voice, eye contact, facial expression, and body posture. Well, even though it's preliminary, I want it to be as complete as possible. Good thinking. And in case you haven't guessed, this profile is for a very important new client and could mean an important new account for us. Managers tend to create a better social and emotional mood with employees for whom they hold high expectations. They smile more and nod their heads approvingly more often. They are generally more supportive, friendly, accepting, and encouraging. See, what do you think about it? It does sound important. I just hope I can handle it. Bill, I know your work, and I know you'll do your best. Come in. Hi, Mike. Oh, hi. How was your weekend? It was very nice. I got that profile I asked you to do. Uh, yeah. Let me explain something here. This is for a very important new client. As with all four factors, climate can communicate negative expectations as well. That's what I mean by important. Now, it's, uh, it could mean a lot to the company, so uh, we've got to handle this one very carefully, if, uh, if you know what I mean. So I'd appreciate it if you would uh, do a little more research and get some additional statistics. Like I said, this is a, this is a very important assignment, and they'll be watching this one like a hawk. Well, I hope I can handle it. 
Well, don't worry. Uh, I know your work, and uh, yeah, I know you'll do your best, right? Same words as our last gal. Quite yeah, different. It's, uh, section six. Uh, did you mean for this to uh, refer to projections on growth or income? Factor number two, feedback. Depending on what managers expect of a subordinate, they will give more or less helpful feedback. If you just uh, go over that again, I'm not sure what it needs. Maybe just uh, some rethinking. Huh? Rethinking. Right. Uh, Miss Fisher, would you give me Jim Davis over at CCM? Pretty rude. Bell read your report last night. Couldn't put it down. Very interesting. Managers give more positive reinforcement to high expectation employees. I think you've touched on a problem. They praise them more for good work and criticize them less for making mistakes. Consequently, confidence grows. I'd like to go over it with you. I'd like that. Good. Now, Bob, this is Ragdell. Yeah, uh, another way managers can convey positive or negative expectations is through factor number three, input. The amount of information they give to the employee. Craig, uh, that'll, that'll do for now. Um, I'm still not too happy with that section on growth and income. Could you do it over again? Well, yes, sir, but you haven't told me what you want, uh, how you want it done. Well, I don't have time to discuss it right now. Um, I tell you what, why don't you, uh, why don't you start by rereading it? You'll see what I mean. Yeah, Bob? Yeah, so tell me, what was the reaction? You're kidding. This training journal has some data for your section on market positioning, and this one has those statistics that you needed. By the way, keep those on file for any future projects. More assignments and projects are given to high expectation employees. In addition, these assignments are more challenging and afford higher visibility within the organization. Sounds great. Jim. You know, Bill. Oh, yeah. He's been working on that client profile I was telling you about. Sure. Nice to see you. You know, I was thinking tomorrow at the meeting when we get together with the other... Jim. You know, Bill. Oh, yeah. He's been working on that client profile I was telling you about. Sure. Nice to see you. You know, I was thinking tomorrow at the meeting when we get together with the other fellows. Davis in the conference room. Uh, Craig, that'll about take care of it for now. Uh, if you'll excuse it. Another way in which expectations can influence behavior is through factor number four, the amount of output or lack of it that a manager encourages from the employee. Uh, Craig, I said that'd be all for now. Yes, sir. But uh, I'd like to put my bid in now for the Evans report. After I finish this report, I'd like for you to consider me for it. Well, I appreciate that, Craig, but uh, frankly, I don't know if you can handle it. Uh, we'll discuss it later, okay? Now, uh, where were we? Uh, yeah, past two obligations. For, uh... And so, I'd like to recommend my assistant bill handle the McLaren account. I know it's a big challenge, but after the way he held the profile, I believe Bill is up to it. Well, I appreciate the vote of confidence. I'd certainly like to try. Managers give high expectation employees more opportunities to speak at meetings, to offer their opinions or to disagree with the manager's opinions. They pay closer attention to their responses and give them more assistance or encouragement in generating solutions to problems. Sounds good, Bill. For all of us, forming expectations is natural and unavoidable. And it seems to be a simple fact that high expectations generally lead to high performance, while low expectations usually produce poor performance. But one thing is certain, the best managers have confidence in themselves and in their ability to hire, develop, and motivate people. And largely because of that self-confidence, they communicate and foster high expectations in those around them.